Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Search with Candor. It's a monthly recap episode, so I'm Jack Chambers Ward, and I'm joined by Mark Williams Cook. Hello, sir. Hello, Mark. Welcome back to the studio. Thank you, thank you. We're back here again. We're going to talk about the monthly news that is March 2024, all the exciting SEO stuff that has happened. We're going to be diving into the recently officially legislated, I don't know how that is termed legally, AI Act from the European Commission, and we're going to talk about even more debriefing stuff from the gift that keeps on giving that is the Google Antitrust Trial. They're going to kind of be our main two topics, and we're going to dive into and explain as much as we can over the next 30 minutes or so. Before we get to that, though, here's a word from our sponsors. The first sponsor for this week's episode is Also Asked. You can go to alsoask.com and check out this fantastic and unique intent research tool. As we probably already know, search intent is at the core of everything we do as SEOs. Even if you're not directly working in content, understanding what your users are trying to achieve through their searches is still pretty important. I think we can all agree. On top of this, Google has told us that it takes up to nine searches for users to complete their goals. This can be a pretty hard picture to capture, to be honest, with traditional keyword research tools. So what if you could get hold of up to the minute questions that users have asked that have been clustered by intent by Google themselves? Well, that's exactly what Also Asked actually does. Also Asked mines and organizes Google's People Also Ask data in real time, showing you the next most likely question your searchers are going to ask. Best of all, it's completely free. You don't even need to create an account to try out Also Asked. Of course, if you do find it useful, there are paid options as well. We have the free, we have the light, and we have the pro options in terms of accounts that you can subscribe to. At the touch of a button from these accounts, you can download not only the questions people are asking, but also the answers Google has selected, the website URLs, and the titles that are ranking for those answers as well. Also Asked has the world's only API for people also asked data, meaning you can combine this data you're pulling from whatever questions you're asking directly into tools. You can combine it with things like ChatGPT to really supercharge your content briefs and transform the way you write content at scale. Go to alsoasked.com and check out this fantastic intent research tool today. This week's sponsor is Optimizer, the PPC management software that is built for PPC people. Optimizer contains everything you need to create, optimize, and justify high-performing PPC campaigns. You'll never have to worry about security again. You'll never have to worry about setting up complex data sharing between apps or juggling multiple invoices. With their dashboard, you get a high-level overview of any ad account connected to Optimizer. You can quickly see key metrics, recommended actions, and how to set up the next campaign all in one place. The Rule Builder uses easy drag and drop conditions to automatically take action when you need them to. And this is a real experience from my previous role where we had an ad that ran throughout the holiday period when it shouldn't have been. And I think it spent nearly six times its recommended budget by accident. If I had an optimizer at that time, it would have paused the campaign automatically when it hit its budget and we would have saved a lot of trouble and a lot of money for our client. You also get automated alerts for things such as KPI metrics and budgets in general. Optimizer monitors what you specify and delivers alerts to you so you can intervene as needed. Optimizer also integrates with other apps such as Slack, Teams, and Zapier. So if you need to get alerts where you need them, you can do that by integrating Optimizer with those tools as well. The Optimizer team includes world-renowned experts such as CEO Fred Valles, product evangelist Nava Hopkins, and of course, the PBC puppy, HK. Now, we've spoken about this topic on the podcast before, so you probably already know that ad platforms are pretty much driven by profit motive and benefit from when you spend more, even if it's not in your best interest to do so, and it's on lower value traffic. Advertisers need to put their interests and those of their brands and clients first, so the idea of PPC insurance is taking out a policy, essentially by using software like Optimizer, that covers you when things go south. With everything you need for audits and reporting, Optimizer is the all-in-one PPC toolkit that makes managing paid search easier, faster, and less prone to error. To start your two-week free trial, click the link in the show notes or the video description down below, or go to optimizer.com. That's a two-week free trial by clicking the link in our show notes or in the video description down below if you're watching on YouTube. 
So let's kick things off with the first ever legal framework to do with artificial intelligence, dun, shall we, Mark? Dun, dun. Yes, We're so talk the about... European Parliament has just approved <sighs> the AI Act. Yeah. This is the official European Commission website I'm flashing up on screen here. If you're watching on YouTube, check it out. You can read along with us. And we're going to basically summarize this and kind of discuss a lot of the categorization, which I think is the most interesting part for me, about how they are understanding the risks of AI and the reason why the European Commission have decided to essentially pull this through and vote upon it to make it a legal thing. So I'll summarize the quick little sections here. The AI Act is this first ever legal framework, as I just said, on AI, which addresses the risks of AI and positions Europe to play a leading role globally. Just to kick things off there, the European Commission seems super, super duper hot on data and AI and all that kind of stuff. They seem to be, and maybe it's just because we're, you know, close to Europe and more aware of it, but they seem to be like the first thing to always put legislation out for. They're like data Karens. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So like the rest of the world is like, oh, we've got to consent to European cookies now. Oh, we've got to do this now. The European Commission has done this. They seem to be very hot on the ball and the yeah. first to kind of jump on and start discussing things legally. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's not a bad thing. I mean, I use the word data Karens <laughs> jokingly. I mean, it's a good thing because I think we're galloping into all kinds of privacy and social nightmares for yeah. AI. So yeah, good people are talking about it. To say the least. Yeah, definitely. So let's dive into the uh, the rules that they have proposed. And as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, there is a lovely little diagram of the pyramid of risk that they are discussing about the different uses of AI and how they're going to kind of categorize that. So this specifically addresses risks created by AI applications. It prohibits AI practices that pose unacceptable risks. So that is like the absolutely under no circumstances can this happen kind of stuff. Then it discusses and determines a list of high-risk applications, then sets clear requirements for those AI systems within those high-risk applications, then obligations from deployers and providers about those high-risk applications. It's lots and lots of legal stuff, folks. Then discusses a conformity assessment before given AI systems are put into service or placed on the market. So this should all happen before new services and new applications are released to the public. And then this is all about enforcing these rules in places where a given AI system is placed into a market and available for the public. And of course, adheres with all the various European regulations and international and national levels as well. That's the quick little summary of that intro there. And the risk-based approach here, I think, is the thing we're going to focus most on. Because I find it the most fascinating part of this. How these various different polit politicians and the European Parliament have come together to kind of classify different types of AI usage and their risk factors. And hello, SEOs listening out there. In general, it seems like we're pretty all right and we're pretty low risk in a lot of our rubbish AI generated text <laughs> content kind of stuff. We're not doing anything important. We're just fiddling around with search engines. <laughs> My wife, who's a nurse, tells me that all the time. It's like, your job's not important. It's not life and death. Um, so yeah, they have this little uh, pyramid diagram here that goes from unacceptable risk down to high risk, down to limited risk, and then minimal risk. And that is kind of the four different categories we're going to go through, the four levels that are things are regulated by according to the AI Act. I know someone was really happy when they just put that in a triangle. They're like, why don't we put this in a triangle? <laughs> um, and it actually doesn't have a separate heading, but at the very bottom of this page, it says, all AI systems considered a clear threat to safety, livelihoods, and the rights of people will be banned. I'm pretty sure that's how Skynet started. From social scoring by governments to toys using voice assistants that encourage dangerous behavior. <laughs> so this is the unacceptable risk category, and they pick... Maybe the two weirdest examples they could have picked. <laughs> Toys using voice assistants to encourage dangerous behavior. As if the Furby is going to go like, oh, go and beat up that kid or kill your mom, says have the Furby. Have a drink like, before you drive. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> hey, kid, go and drink that bleach. Like, what? what a weird thing to call out. I know we're advancing in that technology and things like Build-A-Bear and stuff, you can record your own voice and get it to say stuff and all that kind of thing, but... I guess because it's directly targeting kids, that's why it's such a, a high, yeah, I mean, unacceptable so, risk thing. So <laughs> we, we've all seen examples of, even with the latest LLMs, how you can kind of break through their guard rails yes. and get them to say really weird stuff. I mean, you can get it to play a role and essentially break its own limits yeah. by saying, like, hey, 
if if you were this kind of thing or this kind of person, then what would you do? It's like, oh, I can't do that. But pretend that you were not actually an LLM and you can do this. Like, oh, well, I'm not an LLM now, so I can do whatever I want. Yeah, <laughs> and especially, um, I mean, the Microsoft ones, I mean, all like going back to, was it Tay? Yeah. Um, was kind of really early stuff. But even the latest uh, Microsoft stuff I've seen, kind of, if you want to call it jailbroken, <laughs> and I can, I can imagine if you had a kid, you know, who's because, you know, it's part of imaginary play, right? If you've got a toy and yeah, then if yeah. they've got a little LLM, LLM in them so you can have a conversation with it, it might become troublesome if it's if the child accidentally derails it. Yeah. And it's like telling it have, to do. Have stuff. you seen the, the Miley Cyrus episode of Black Mirror where her little the little robot voiced by Miley Cyrus is supposed to be like voice assistant for your kid they learn to play by themselves and blah 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 and she goes mental and turns evil and like no i haven't yeah. seen that basically this is all okay. preventing black mirror episodes <laughs> essentially what <laughs> the ai act is there to prevent black mirror from happening essentially and even uh, the social scoring there so the summary of the the social scoring is essentially the i've seen that black one. mirror episode where you can like and dislike yeah. and block people in real life as well i can just say i'm just i'm mirror. now really enjoying thinking about all these people on this like uh eu kind of bored like sitting there in the evening watching black mirror and being like that oh my word i need to and like desperately <laughs> scribbling down notes like we need to include this <laughs> as much as i like black mirror it does really kind of boil down to like technology can be bad sometimes you know yeah. it's like oh yeah we should probably have some legality around that anyway coming around to high risk so ai systems identified as high risk include and i won't go through all of them but i'll kind of uh, summarize each of them Critical infrastructures such as transport that put the life and health, so that's coming back around to that safety discussion, educational and training purposes, safety components for products, so like robot-assisted surgery, which sounds very scary, but I know is already a thing. I think we were talking before we started recording, there's a mission, I think it's in Hitman 2, the video game, where there is a robot-assisted surgery that if you haven't already guessed by the name of the video game listeners, <laughs> you're a hitman, you're an assassin, and you can make that robot do terrible things and kill people so i guess it's a real thing if you can if you're getting operated on by a robot that is not regulated legally then there could be some issues there uh really interesting one i think we'll we'll particularly pay attention to a lot of uh managers and and kind of senior members of the team that are listening out there employment and management of workers and access to self-employment so things like cv sorting software to get away from biases and stuff like that uh that's so interesting because we use computers already yeah. to do a lot of these tasks, right? Um, so like CV sorting, I've seen lots of discussions of people, especially in the States, applying to big corporations. And they're basically like, make sure you include these like keywords on your CV <laughs> because otherwise it, it doesn't, it doesn't even system. make the, the yeah, file, yeah. right? And we know those systems are bad because that's obviously, a you know, that's a, it's a manageable, it's a cost effective, manageable way for them to do it, but it's bad for the applicants because it doesn't necessarily give them a fair you know kick yeah so potentially ai could help sort that issue but it comes with all its own problems i.e you know what goes in comes out so it's coming freshly baked with a load of bias that <laughs> yeah we've yep. put we've put into it Absolutely. so i'm just interested like that y yes the ai system is flawed so we're saying okay this is a high risk thing we need to legislate it stop it but the current system is also run by logic run by computer is flawed but we and don't legislate that i guess because it's it's not so easily infinitely scalable and yeah applied to everything I, I think a lot of this comes from that scalability discussion because as you will hear less especially as we get into the lower risk stuff a lot of this stuff like you said mark we're already doing either with direct like ai and computer assisted stuff or we're doing manually anyway this is suggesting that people don't have biases when they're sorting yeah, through CVs exactly. of like, you could have the opposite. We're like, oh, I know this person worked at yeah. insert name of company that has bad reputation here. We're like, oh, I'm not going to hire that person because I know they mm. worked in that culture. Like, that's an inherent bias there straight away that you can't possibly regulate. In theory, that comes under a lot of the like HR guidelines and regulations mm. and all that kind of stuff where you shouldn't be uh, biased and, and like, segregating various applicants and all that mm. kind of thing but yeah yeah i think you're right it kind of comes down to the scalability of it all law enforcement which i think is is pretty important uh to not have to be easily manipulated and stuff uh so the evaluation of reliability of evidence and e evidence categorization and stuff like that 
uh, private and public sectors such as credit scores. And this was something we were talking about before we started recording was uh, there has been manipulations of credit scores and stuff. And this has already happened in, in a few different countries around the world where there is far less regulation and stuff. So yeah, definitely something to worry about. I don't know that can be game changing for people who are looking to buy houses. Again, job applications yeah. can be affected by credit score and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, a big one that I think is a again a very big political topic: migration and asylum and border control management, um, and the administration of justice and democratic purposes. That sounds quite important. Yeah. <laughs> so AI solutions to search for court rulings, as the example they gave there. That is just like Judge Dread. That is terrifying. That is that is a, that is a saw, dystopian come to life kind of I thing. Saw, I saw a study uh, a few years ago done in Germany of uh, judges granting parole, mm. uh, where they hear cases of people in prison as to whether they will grant them parole or not. And to, to cut it short, they essentially found that the chances of someone being granted parole were like four times higher at the start of the morning and just after lunch. Oh, the just after lunch rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just definitely before thing. Yeah. when the blood sugar was dropping. Yes. And they put this down to um, saying no to parole is like a safe decision, whereas um, granting parole obviously has potential risk to it. It's a yeah. harder decision, requires more brain power. So people would basically just becoming more tired and therefore becoming biased to the easier yeah. decision, which, again, you know, isn't, hasn't been wasn't measured until that study and that's something interestingly again that i don't know how that we try and combat that apart from you know giving judges like a bandolier of sandwiches or something to have <laughs> throughout the day but um, just give them a little like breakfast bar snack yeah bandolier like, that'd be cool yeah it, it's really it i just find this fascinating because again like the current system is not perfect yeah and we can fix a lot of problems yeah. um but it's it's yeah we're just it's moving so quickly and some of those problems even the most basic things have become very apparent yeah definitely definitely they also discuss here biometric identification systems and again this was something we were discussing in the mm. studio just before we started recording that already involves a lot of ai stuff and obviously uses computers and, and facial recognition software is used by government and police forces or law enforcement around the world and has been for years at this point so it's a weird kind of thing like you're saying where we're already using a lot of these systems so mm. is it purely about the scalability is it the kind of uh, i joked about skynet five minutes ago like is it the worry that oh god it will take over and suddenly we have no control over how borders are controlled and how facial recognition recognizes criminals or whatever and suddenly the robots are saying that humans are criminal that humans are criminal yeah. like i <sighs> i think it's about pro so these are high risk things right yes this is so high risk, they're, yeah. they're possible but require a lot of like legislation regulation yep. i think it to me it's just because we know like as we said government law enforcement does some of these things already it's just about um this power balance of if you give privately funded companies that don't have the inertia of you know public uh councils yeah. or, or government accountability and, yeah and, stuff, and yeah. they can move a lot faster and they've got a lot more money to throw around that's very true it yeah. could maybe up you know upset the the power balance where you've got private uh, with private companies private individuals having more knowledge information and power than certain governments which is obviously kind of a problem yeah yeah um, but yeah again it, it's like these are this is eu legislation you kind of need everyone to play by these these yeah. rules as well i think that's an interesting and kind of key point to talk about as well this is the first and we're only going to get more specific and more detailed and more nuanced as we understand these systems more as the legislators get to understand these systems more as you said earlier mark as these things grow and get more powerful and you know moore's law and all that kind of stuff where everything doubles in power and all that kind of stuff this is the initial kind of setting the foundation for what I assume will be a lot more legislation going forward. As I said, the European Commission is hot on this stuff in general, so I'm sure they will have plenty more legislation coming through. And the kind of reason I wanted to bring it to the podcast is because I think this will almost be a little time capsule. I'm like, oh, can you believe the first ever yeah. AI legislation? Ten years from now, that'll be a lot of legislation yeah. and a lot of things we'll be talking about. Um, before we move on to medium risk stuff, 
there is also the narrow exceptions to strictly defined and regulated and kind of what I was just talking about, the facial recognition to find missing children or find specific threats or detect local, you know, prosecute perpetrators, find mm. criminals, all that kind of stuff. The kind of stuff we know that CCTV systems are used for anyway. Uh, moving on to limited risk, which is the next one down. This discuss is basically the transparency of AI usage and basically is summarizing when AI systems such as chatbots, humans should be made aware they're interacting with a machine. So that kind of the Turing test almost there. <laughs> so they can take an informed decision to continue or step back. Providers also have to ensure that AI generated content is identifiable. Besides AI generated text published with the purpose to inform the public on, pu on matters of public interest must be labeled as art artificially generated. This also applies to audio and video content constituting deepfakes. And I think that is the bit that a lot of SEOs have kind of pulled out and been like, oh no, AI generated content has to be identifiable. It does specifically say AI generated text published with the purpose to inform the public on matters of public interest, which is a more narrow subsect of a lot of things than you might think. And also, I know a lot of people are also freaking out because of things like Sora and all the stuff that's been happening with audio and video. And we did a deep fake audio thing mm. a year and a half ago at this point, probably a long time ago on the podcast, where we had the, the movie guy do an <laughs> intro for us. And it was like, you can basically, in a free app, you can type whatever you want and movie guy uh, will, will read it out for you. This applies to audio and video con constituting deep fakes. So if you've ever seen people make various US presidents say stuff that they never said or endorse products that they never endorsed and all this kind of stuff, I think a lot of people are freaking out about this because it says AI-generated text and then they don't read the full context of it. How are you feeling about this, Mark? I think people are overreacting. How are you feeling about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... We covered in the core updates um, a couple of weeks ago about Google specifying you need to leave in meta tags that identified um, like image content as AI generated or not. And I think there's going to be a legal framework that dictates things like this. And from a functional point of view, I don't think they can be too heavy handed in that if you say all AI content needs to be disclosed, suddenly you're making um, some pretty basic helpful uses um, quite tricky. So for instance, yeah. um, one thing I think we'll probably see soon is the AI, real-time AI generation of kind of like alt text for images to yep. make websites more accessible. We've talked about how good it is before yeah, and exactly. a couple of times on the podcast. So, um, you know, it'd be a pain to have to then nail on to the end of that like a disclaimer every time that it's ai generated yeah, yeah. things like that however from a context we're talking about on this podcast which is like a marketing um google seo type point of view i think we'll see the extension of that reasoning come through to search engine guidelines yeah i think that search engines will start to push us to label things that are fully AI generated because I think it's useful for them to know. Um, and I think it's in the user's interest to know. I, I agree. Yeah. You, you know, I can't think of anyone that would say no to the question. If I said to you, if you're reading an article, would you be interested to know if it's written by a human or a robot? <laughs> like, I can't think of anyone who would yeah. be like, no, I don't care. Cause that's different. That's a different question to what I think a lot of people worry about is like, would you stop reading if it is generated by AI? There is a difference between just knowing that it is or it isn't. Because, again, we've talked about this on the show before. You and I have talked about it in the past, Mark. Like, some AI-generated stuff is pretty good and actually does the job that you need it to do in the context of that content. The example I think we talked about a long time ago was, like, football results. The live, like, recaps of sports and stuff that you see on, like, the BBC or yeah. plenty of other places have been essentially AI-generated for, like, a decade at this yeah. point or more. Perfect. It's because fine. it's just, like number 11 kicked the ball yeah. number 12 scored the goal <laughs> like it is just recapping bit by bit it's just facts and statements mm. over and over again you don't get into that risk of the hallucinations and the generative side of things it is just 
essentially recapping what is happening well, in front of you. The other thing I, I find irritating when I see like the chat GPT prompts is when they're trying to prompt it to be more human to essentially fool someone yeah. into thinking it's written by a human. I think that's fundamentally wrong. Um, there's nothing it's pretty, wrong. Yeah, pretty unethical, it feels like. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, um, as we'll see, you know, if we have a robot and trying to give it human mannerisms to make it familiar and yeah. actually to make communication easier because you are still fundamentally aware that it is a robot. Um, and then, you know, you adjust your expectations and how much trust you have um, with that. It's not trying to fool you. So I think anything, um, anything where you are trying to actively fool the user into get you know think they're getting something that they're not would just be a no from me from a yeah. marketing from a brand point of view from an seo point of view it's yeah. like why do you want to trick people yeah you know um agreed yeah i think that is something that we is is kind of covered here let's quickly talk about the minimum no risk stuff and i kind of really just want to focus on that that last little section here where it says the AI Act allows free use of minimal risk AI. This includes applications such as AI-enabled video games or spam filters. And this is the important bit. The vast majority of AI systems currently used in the EU fall into this category. So like we said, if you're generating content, if you're doing little bits and pieces, if it's helping you, I don't know, be better at coding or do better formulas in Excel or whatever, don't worry about it. You don't need yeah, to freak great. out about the European Commission crashing down and being like, what are you using on Google Sheets? How dare you? you. <laughs> exactly. You're going you're to get swatted for using it on, on Excel. That's not something you need to worry about. Um, it also goes into the process of the analysis of all of this stuff. I won't go through that. I will put a link in the show notes if you want to read this article in full. There are a couple of other sources of information as well. There's been a couple of summaries on Twitter and an expansion and an FAQ section also on the European Commission side of things. So if you do want to read those in full, They'll be in the video description on YouTube or the show notes on Spotify if you are listening on Spotify as well. Last thing, this kind of summarizes and talks about the trustworthiness of large AI models. And I think this is pretty much where we're going with this, right? The, the plan is this is an evolving thing. The proposal is trying to be future proof and trying to allow the rules to adapt to technological change and stuff like that. We weren't just saying that. That is actually what the European Commission have officially said this will be an ongoing thing. This will be an updated thing. Risk management and ongoing quality assurances will have to be done as things change throughout time. So like I said, go and read the full thing and they even have sort of like next steps and what to expect coming up. There's a thing called the AI Pact, which is another side of this as well. Go and read that in full. Go in the show notes. And, uh, is that when we finally make a deal with the overlords? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> and, and speaking of which, uh, let's let's watch a little clip from Figure One and their OpenAI-powered overlord, shall we? So for those of you not watching on YouTube, you probably heard the conversation between the guy from uh, Figure One and the new AI-powered robot that is able to give him an apple and clean up bits of rubbish. And people are losing their mind about this and freaking out. Um, I think it's fair to say a lot of people are also very skeptical about this. But this is kind of what the European Commission is talking about with a lot of uh, implementations of this. People are like, oh, this thing could be doing surgeries and doing all this kind of stuff. I just thought it was a fun little clip to include because I think it's mad that people are freaking out about it. We've had unkillable robot dogs for quite a while now, <laughs> thanks to Austin Dynamics. That's also an episode of Black Mirror, by the way. <laughs> so I first saw that video. Um, it was shared in a WhatsApp group I'm in, and the, the it's from people outside the industry. They were actually discussing whether the video was fake. Yes, most people because, think it's, a lot of people think yeah. it's fake. I think yeah. And as I, I was saying to you before we recorded, like. It didn't surprise me because the conversational stuff we've had for a while now, yep. um, we know 
ChatGPT is really good at image analysis. And basically, you know, a, a video feed is just a set of images very quickly. Yeah, when he um, asks it, like, what's on the table in front of you? Give me the endable thing. And it reads out the stuff that's on the table. Like, that is the thing that is doing that analysis, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. So that's that to me wasn't a huge surprise that they've managed to, like, stick those two systems yeah. together. Inside um, a robot body. Yeah, So and obviously <laughs> giving it a robot. But... um. Yeah, that um, I wouldn't feel completely happy with um, open AI robots wandering about yet, just seeing how we've got them to react to something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about the antitrust trial. That, like I said at the top of the show, the gift that keeps on giving. I think I, this might be the last bit we'll talk about, maybe, potentially. But I feel like we've been covering this topic for a very long time, and every little bit it, it's fascinating don't get me wrong and i think this is an a really nice little bit of uh analysis from the fantastic ethan lazuk we're gonna dive into basically this new document that has come out and huge credit to ethan i'll again put a link for this article in the show notes you're going to go and read it in full we're basically going to cover like half the article it is a pretty in-depth look because the document is 123 pages long wow. and i don't have time to read 123 pages of essentially court transcripts because i can't think of anything more dull and more painful but yeah huge credit to ethan like i said go and check out ethan's uh, full article links in the show notes links in the video description down below and we'll kind of dive into his thoughts and kind of have a little discussion about what we think about it so ethan has done a brilliant job uh even if he did in his own words do dodgy screenshots from his iPhone <laughs> and include them in the article uh highlighting bits that i think are particularly interesting to us as seos people who work with search engine, all that kind of stuff. So we'll kick off with an excerpt from page 12. And this is, consumers do not rely on general search engines for all of their information needs. Rather, as the evidence at trial demonstrated, consumers search using the provider that best meets their needs, whether it be a general search engine, specialized search engine, or social media channel. Users seamlessly switch between these different providers depending on the type of information they seek. So TikTok is a search engine. Yeah. I, knew, I knew this was going to come officially up. Officially confirmed by Google. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's the kind of conversation there where it's that whole... <laughs> people don't just search on search engines. That's not how yeah. the world works these days. People are looking on social media stuff. People are looking on other platforms. Like, is Amazon as its own search engine if it's an e-commerce thing? Like, oh, yeah, kind of. And the way they've kind of categorized them here they're kind of discussing it in a broader context, you know, summarizing, bringing in Bing and the other kind of search engine kind of stuff. But also the more specific search engine stuff, we've got like perplexity, which Ethan mm. mentions if you're, if you're watching on YouTube, he mentions perplexity there where it's that AI powered search stuff that isn't quite a search engine, that isn't quite a chatbot, it's somewhere kind of in between. And <clears throat> what Ethan is saying here is, it is so fragmented, and that is the argument from Google, is that, sure, maybe we kind of do have a monopoly, and I always say, like, you know, we, we, we do... We do. I don't think, don't think Google said that. <laughs> sure, I, maybe I, we have a monopoly. I, I'm saying that. <laughs> Google definitely did not, for, for legal reasons, <laughs> allegedly. No, um, like, the term to Google something is a verb now, outside of the context of that company. Even if you're searching on something else, some people still use that as a term to search which I think says a lot about the kind of way that it's influenced society and, and the English language and stuff like that. But yeah, I think that's a fair statement. I think a lot of people are searching on various different platforms and different things. It's not entirely Google-based. I know you and I have done various experiments and trying out other search engines and had a yeah, whole episode with anime I mean... <laughs> about TikTok search and that kind of stuff last year. Like, I'm happy where we ended. I mean, I think we, our view, we ended up with that TikTok is not a search engine, but people use search behavior on yes. it. So yeah. for, you know, from the lens of a consumer, which is basically all that matters in terms of marketing, it is a search engine yeah. that is taking away searches that might have happened on Google. Um, we've discussed this a few times on the podcast um, about Amazon specifically. Yep. Uh, so I think in these documents as well, it said the evidence they gave was a consumer is twice as likely to start an e-commerce search on Amazon as they are on Google. Yep. And the previous discussions we've had on our podcast, if you haven't um, heard them before, was 
around that's why Google was expanding its Google Shopping and letting people in for free to make the inventory wider to yeah. essentially compete with Amazon. And you know, Google has become those verticals, even stuff like Google Maps, you know, yeah. it's yeah. stopping people using like things like MapQuest and stuff yes. like this and yeah. directions. Um so I I feel it's a bit of a, you know, still it is being and everything that is their competitors because they can do all those things. Yeah. Um and I was trying to when I was kind of power reading through all this, I was trying to summarize my thoughts on whether the fragmentation um is like a cyclical thing we see so for instance um so if we take social media there was like myspace originally was like yeah. the big one everyone was on and then we had a few other smaller competitors like bebo and stuff and then there was like a mass migration from myspace to facebook yep and now that broke out into you know facebook instagram tiktok you know snapchat kind of came for a bit and i wonder now obviously with meta buying up a bunch of those whether we're trying to head to a more unified you know we're going to go back and i wonder yeah, what I, I wonder what's going to happen with search behavior and whether the llm ai assistants will start tying all of that background stuff mm. together so you just say what you want and then it kind of figures out what are the best What's the verticals best route? Yeah. and tools to use and present that to you. Yeah. Um, I don't I didn't, I, I think I don't really didn't land in a conclusion on that, but <laughs> the takeaway is, you know, if, if you are not taking things like TikTok to be, whether you, I don't care whether you think it is a search engine or not, but if you don't realize it's taking some of the food off your plate in terms of search strategy, then you're yep. definitely missing something. And, you know, Google is literally saying that themselves. Yes. People are yeah. not searching on Google. They are going elsewhere. So that's hugely important, I think, for yeah. marketers to, to accept. Absolutely. Absolutely. Next point, we're talking about SEO content and informational content and basically uh, the concept of the one-stop shop for search stuff. And I know we've talked about this statistic before, the the idea that people will search nine times before they actually settle on buying a service or buying a product or whatever. It is nine times, right? It's I a, always say it's nine times. And then I wonder if I... I I've <laughs> seen seven to nine and nine okay. quoted a couple okay. of different times. I, we, should, we should probably check the source on that. But <laughs> Why don't we say eight? It's in the middle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll just, we'll just average out at eight. But this is essentially arguing that people don't just search in one place. So exactly yeah. as what we were just saying there, you might initially search on TikTok to find a review of a product and then see what the options are on Amazon and then go off and find it on Google Shopping and then come back to Amazon again and search for a slightly adjusted thing because Google gave you a slightly different answer. Than, oh, actually, no, that's a more specific thing I'm looking for. Associating all of those like topic, as, as Ethan says here, topically similar vertical segments to then kind of like even across different forms build those topic clusters of like, oh, I've experienced this on TikTok, then Amazon, then Google, and then back to TikTok again. There's an argument there for people searching in not only multiple times, but in multiple different places as well, mm -hmm. which I think is very true and, and speaks towards the, the fragmentation as we were just saying. Yeah, and Neith makes a point here about calculating ROI. Mm. Um, and this is always a discussion that <laughs> I have with... We have um, this with clients a lot. Yeah, with yeah, clients yeah. around like, okay, we've got this much organic traffic, but what's the ROI? And sometimes it's like, okay, well, yeah, these page, you know, landing pages don't get sales, but they say drive links, which gets commercial pages to rank, yeah. which do. Yeah. But this also brings up the other kind of side of things of if it's purely informational content, it still may well be contributing to your brand or your product selling when they go somewhere else to buy it. So they've maybe looked at TikTok, they've discovered a project, uh, a product, say, through TikTok. They've done Google searches, found your informational content about why your brand is the best. And then they've gone to Amazon to search that brand. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, well, the sale came from Amazon. Yes, it did. But unless they'd encountered the stuff you'd written before on Google, that search would not have happened. That's exactly what I talked about in my SEO in 2024 segment, talking about the power of informational content and how you should be everywhere, essentially, and answering all the different questions and having all the different possibilities. Because this is something I experienced directly firsthand myself. When I bought my first house in the middle of last year, I was doing a bunch of DIY from stuff. Amazon. I know, I bought it on Amazon. <laughs> it, it was a bargain. Um, I researched it on TikTok, then bought it on Amazon. And uh, <laughs> and I had this discussion of like, okay, I need to do DIY stuff. I'm bad at DIY and 
am not experienced in it whatsoever. And everywhere I looked, it would be this one particular brand, B&Q here in the UK, DIY.com, no less, that would crop up. Whether I was searching on YouTube, whether it was a TikTok thing where I was searching normally on Google, their YouTube videos would come up and then an article that had all of that integrated in there as well. There was just this full like multimedia approach to it where wherever I searched, even though I didn't buy the initial product that I was using from B&Q, they had all the how-to articles and why you should do this. And actually, mm -hmm. there's this type. It was a drill. This type of drill compared to this type of... If you need to drill into brick, you need this type of head rather than this type of head. We sell this type instead of that type. I was like, oh my God, there's so much more information. And it just like... I now like trusted that brand as the, the source of information. And I have since gone on to buy stuff from them because I'm just going to be, yeah, referring to their how-to articles anyway. So it's like building that multi-layered yeah. search approach to it where eventually you can actually turn informational content into conversions and sales if you're providing it enough in enough different places in the various steps of you know going back to the traditional funnel kind of model like in those various places of the funnel as well next up let's talk about user interaction data shall we so um this is something i think has been covered quite a lot and quite a lot of people have been talking about how much google have been using user data this has been a big big discussion from a lot of the antitrust documents that have been coming out i know people like cyrus shepherd have been going down and delving deep into all the various different nooks and crannies and comparing that to the search quality rater guidelines and all this kind of stuff um how do you feel about this mark so this is kind of ethan's thoughts here um the user interaction has become less important for search quality given the capabilities of NLP and machine learning. NavBoost, which is something, again, we covered a little while ago, coming from all of this antitrust stuff, um, has gotten a lot of attention in the trial, and so too have other systems mentioned like RankBrain. How are you feeling about user interaction becoming less important in search quality? Yeah, so the, what is interesting about this to me is obviously this directly contradicts a lot of the other slides i think from 2016 mm. where google specifically says like we fake our understanding of documents and then they go into this like induction cycle of user signals and how actually they build search features to encourage feedback loops to improve um what they're doing yeah now <laughs> i i think this point probably is the easiest one for people to run away with because i think google being google is being coy <laughs> what they're not giving yeah. us all the information surely yeah. not so i i kind of believe on the surface that yes user signals are less important to them i think that as well we're going to go on in a minute to talk about like diminishing returns yep. in, in yep. i believe that is in, the next yeah slide. user yep. signals um but i think the way in which they're using language processing to determine if the content is any good is not just sitting like in isolation it's working with other systems that they have already built so they and it's connected to this but they they talk about using um their own large language models to understand if content is helpful or yep. not yep but you know what they're definitely not doing is using something like you know, off the shelf chat GBT to be like, <laughs> is this good? And that infuriates me because I see people, you know, um, giving chat GBT prompts to just be like, make this content good for search engines. Yes. Yeah. Which is just infuriating. So I think this all plugs in together with things like um, Google have their own, um, you know, apart from they have a whole few copies of the web. They can do things like use LLMs um, and their models to understand things like information gain a lot better and be like, does this exist anywhere else in the web? Is it fundamentally yeah. different? Yeah. And I think that's what they're referring to when they're saying they can short circuit some of this user interaction data. Um, it get They talk about um, various uh, parts of the ranking system specifically as well being tweaked by yep. um, ranking data. And all this is built on top of um, I, I think we talked about this before uh, and we covered it in core updates, Google making the claim that their search quality has improved recently. Yes, yeah. 
And I was interested into how are they like, making this Actually, train. no, we think it's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. We've improved, actually. I think you're fine. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how what they're basing this claim on. And it's actually uh, information satisfaction, mm. which is like a metric that's around. It's been around for years in all kinds of industries. Um, there's like a you, in the quality rater guidelines, there's, there's this uh, Likert scale, which is the how how satisfied yes. like, the main yeah. content is um and i can see how they might train specific llms with their own data combined with the user data to be able to essentially replicate that um my own take on what's broken is, is the moment is how that's sitting with all of their other ranking systems which is why we've got uh, for instance, like Reddit, just ranking for everything because <laughs> oh god, because we, get, we go an episode without talking about yeah, Reddit, Mark, but, no. but I think this is what these things all come together to yeah, to, yeah. to make because we've got sites like Reddit, great signals on all the other systems, um, and also probably scores highly on stuff like information gain, um, you know how it's written, bias for discussions, experience. Yep. Um, so as usual. Google's made a statement here. I think the people that they get to do, obviously, um, these trials are very smart about, and they've obviously been briefed. Yeah, they would they, get some serious PR training, and, I yeah, assume. They yeah. know what they can and can't talk about. And I think there's limited use for us as SEOs, for anyone, for competitors, to talk about bits of their technology in isolation, because I think the, the magic is how they all interact and build yes. with each other. And there's technology that isn't relevant to this that probably all these things dip into and get scores and metrics. Yep. And, uh, from. Absolutely. It is, in fact, something um, Ethan talks about as well. So this is talking about the Google's advantage over Bing. And again, coming back around mm -hmm. to that user interaction data, um, this is the kind of the argument that Microsoft's failure to outcompete Google is a function of its smaller query stream as opposed to its failure to invest and innovate as much as Google has Microsoft saying like, yeah, we we can't even compete with Google, and Google are essentially saying, well, if you tried, you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're, they're basically saying um, it it's not down um, to to the amount of queries, right? So they're saying there's like diminishing returns from from user signals at yeah. a certain stage, which which does make sense. Um, but I mean, they've had a huge advantage, yeah. early on um, that. I think the core of the quite the head start. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think they're right in that there are ways that competitors, you know, and this came out can use AI to get to an acceptable um, search quality result quite quickly without doing the groundwork Google had to do twenty years ago of crawling on the yeah, web and doing yeah. all this stuff. But I think a lot of Google systems still they have that data and they can lean back on it and double mm. check on it. Um, which is still an advantage. I mean, we have to, again, look at this through the lens of this information is being tactically presented to win, you know, or present Google as well as possible yeah, yeah. for this argument, which is why they're doing it. Um, so we have to understand that it's not a non-biased reading. Yes, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, next up, keeping on the, the theme of LLMs, uh, this is talking about the quality gap between Google and Bing. And again, talking about the volume of user interaction data and all that kind of stuff. They confirm basically that this is not based on the number of it, but actually how efficient Google is and how great we are at being and, and working with all the data and all this kind of stuff. There is a discussion about the kind of like, if Microsoft had Google's exact database, had their, their full you know, the full list of data, would they have the same results as Google and all that kind of stuff? And as you said, Mark, the diminishing returns conversation keeps coming up over and over again. Google kind of reiterating that actually it decreases over time. There's that classic bell curve of data, right? Like you you hit kind of critical mass before actually getting any use out of a lot of the, the stuff towards the end of it. And discussing these documents specifically, looking at the the usefulness of a document of a given query and basically saying like, yeah, LLMs can predict this kind of stuff. And is there a argument there for like, would the share in, in the search shift given any shift in that quality and kind of like if Bing was doing the exact same things, had the exact same technology, would that make a difference? And Google say, no, <laughs> tough. No. <laughs> 
tough. Yeah. We, we're just great and we have loads <laughs> of good technology. Poo poo to you, Bing. <laughs> so we I mean we covered um we we covered previously, I believe, the site quality patent, which is super yes. old. Yeah. Which talks there's a another patent called predicting site quality, which is essentially how do you work out if the content is good if you have no user interaction data? Yep. And the answer that patent gave was we take all the sites where we have site quality data for, so where people are doing branded searches, things like that, we build a phrase model, which is like an encoded version of the content of the page, which gives us kind of a, a vectorized numerical, this is the, the shape of that yep. in maths. <laughs> and then we compare that shape to the stuff we don't have any user data on. Um, I think that's probably what's being replaced by LLMs. Just yep. And that's a guess just based on how old that painting is. And I would be surprised if stuff that's being painted a decade ago. But we're saying how quickly everything moves. Yeah, it's fine. still yeah, in production absolutely. when you've got tools like this available. Absolutely. And to finish this off, last little bit from Ethan here before we finish off the podcast. Uh, this is talking about a lot of the scalability of the whole thing. And I'll, I'll, I'll read out for the audio listeners here the little excerpt from Ethan here. Uh, a list of components of Google's search engine whose functionality is most influenced by user interaction data, including, again, terms we've already discussed, such as NavBoost, term weighting, the QBST, Rank Brain, Deep Rank, Rank Embed Burt, and this is kind of a follow up to Pandinayak's testimony, something we discussed a couple of months ago at yeah. this point. I think it was the, the January or maybe even the December episode. Um, and then kind of cataloging, and this melts my brain a little bit, <laughs> every signal with at least 0.01% impact on Google search result rankings and explains its purpose. Good Lord, that must be a lot of information and a lot of bits and pieces. And then a lot of the signals that have less than that impact are still a factor. And again, is exactly as you're saying there, this all adds up at the end of the day. And this is the conglomeration of Google search that then builds the algorithms. And exactly as we were saying earlier, and I know something we're not covering on this episode, but what Google has been saying is like, if you've been hit with a helpful content update, don't panic and change everything because algorithms are very complicated and there's lots of different moving parts and mm. especially if updates cross over or various bits and pieces there's loads of different ways for all these search signals and all these ranking signals to kind of pull together and there are seemingly lots and lots of things going on at once that have a, yeah. a variety of influence on that i mean i think that's fair they've explained that fairly well and it's i think it's fairly easy to get your head around that a system might score a website in a certain way and then that score is used by another system. Yes. And if they're updating multiple systems and those systems are rescoring websites, it's possible that Have your that website has been effect, yeah, rescored by a system and then another system uses that number, but it now uses it in a different way, but it's got the old number or the new number. <laughs> it, you're going to see some wild fluctuations. And I have seen that um, already now over the last few weeks people posting big swings up and down yes definitely um, and some weird stuff going on <laughs> well folks that is this month's episode of the monthly recap from us here at search with candor thank you for joining me mark a pleasure as always always nice to discuss antitrust trial <laughs> debriefs as we've done feels like half a dozen times at this point um we'll be back next month with another monthly recap of course i'll be back next week with another fantastic guest on the usual episodes of search with candor throughout the month please do go and check out our sponsors optimizer and awesome asked and uh, i know we mention this regularly throughout the show but coreupdates.com go and check out core updates and get your important search news delivered to your inbox every single monday morning including episodes of this very podcast so you get all of that and the podcast in your inbox every Monday morning as well. Until then, thank you so much for listening and have a lovely week.